was born in Huntington, actually, in Huntington, West Virginia. My family migrated from, on my father's side, migrated from Milledgeville, Georgia, and came here early for work on the railroad. Uh, I was born in the CNO Hospital, which is now owned by Marshall University, and it is a parking lot. But they had a hospital there, and that's where I was born. My mother's family came from Alabama, and her father moved here when she was a young girl. They came here for, uh, believe it or not, work on the railroad. At that time, the railroad was hiring, and it became knowledge throughout the eastern part of the United States that they would hire people regardless of their color. And they were, in fact, hiring many, many uh, uh, African Americans. I grew up in, uh, in Huntington and a little bit unique that I split time between Huntington and Macon and Milledgeville, Georgia. Uh, as soon as school was out in Huntington, West Virginia, uh, we traveled because my dad worked on the railroad. We traveled for free. Uh, dependents got to travel on the train for free and so as a result of that, each summer we would, uh, as soon as school was out, we would leave and go to uh, Macon, Georgia. That's where the, the train came into Macon. And uh, to be honest about it, it was my first real uh, knowledge about uh, segregation. Now, even though they had it here, it was not a big deal. And when we got on the train, normally we got there 15 or 20 minutes before the train arrived. So we didn't go into the waiting areas that were clearly marked white only, colored only. We, we very seldom went in. But in Georgia, it was so uh, remarkable because on one side you had a little narrow three-foot room that was like a, a hallway or a corridor. And on the other side you had this big spacious room and, uh, and I think you can imagine which was which. And so because we many times had to go in when the train came, we'd have to wait. I'd have to wait for my uncle to come to pick us up. We lived in Macon and he would come and pick us up. We had to wait in the waiting room. So it was really my first eye-opener, if you will, uh, to uh, uh, segregation. So we would travel to every summer to Milledgeville and to, to Macon, and then we'd ride over to Milledgeville, which is about 18 miles from, from Macon. Uh, and so we did that every summer from the time I was, from the time I can remember. So I, it was probably preschool until I was 16 or 17 years old and ready to go into college. Traveled there and spent my summers there. Played, played ball down there. Uh, enjoyed the southern life. But the, the unique thing is, every every summer before we departed, I got this lecture on how to behave in the deep south in order to survive for my mom. And it was uh, it was something else, you know. Like if you're walking on the sidewalk and a white person is walking toward you, do not look them in the eye move off of the sidewalk so that they can pass before you move on. Do not look them in the eye and make sure if they speak to you, say hello. That's all. Keep your head down. So I learned how to behave to survive and it didn't, that didn't make sense to me except I followed, of course I followed my mother's instructions, but uh, in, in the mid-1950s it made all the sense in the world to me when I heard about Emmett Till. Uh, kid, who 14-year-old kid who traveled from Chicago to Money, Mississippi to visit his relatives and ended up uh, at the bottom of the river because he whistled uh, on a white one. And of course that made national news. Emmett Till was, was one of the, the real uh, fire starters to the Civil Rights Movement. And so it really stuck home with me. That there was a reason my mother gave me those instructions, those, that instruction kit to survive. And there's a reason she did that. And, uh, Emmett Till brought it all home to me while it was done. And so that's the rules I lived by when I went south. But, uh, uh, I enjoyed the country life of, of uh, Georgia. Just really enjoyed it because it was so different. We farmed. I milked cows. I learned how to, to grow vegetables and uh, uh, do gardening down there. Uh, I learned about a total, total, absolute total segregated even though segregation was in Huntington, it just wasn't that big a deal. We didn't see it as a big deal. Number one, the population was, was never overwhelming. When Huntington was about 70 to 80,000 people, there might have been 5,000 African-American families that lived here, or 5,000 African-Americans. 
Uh, now, which, which you know was roughly seven or eight percent of the population. Uh, now, the population is probably two percent African American, and so it never has been such a gigantic number. Uh, as they say, sometimes numbers are about about power. And we never have been enough numbers in Huntington to create any threat to anybody, in my opinion. And so I don't think it was ever a threat. But growing up in Huntington, coming back to the Huntington side of it, uh, I liked Huntington simply because it was, it, today I like it because it's, it's, it, it's not a big city. You can walk almost anywhere in 15 or 20 minutes in Huntington. And I liked that. But when I was growing up, it had even greater appeal because you could walk anywhere in Huntington any time, day or night without any fear of anything bad happening to you. Uh, you could come into your home when I was growing up and we never even locked our doors. We didn't lock our car doors, we didn't lock our house doors. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the morning and my friends, some black, some white, to be standing at my bedside. Get up, we're going to play ball, or get up, we're going to the park. And, and that's the way we grew up and it wasn't unusual for me to be at their home early in the morning. Come on, get up, we're going to play ball, we're going to the park, or we're just going to the river to swim. And that's what we did. That, I, mean, we, I grew up, I learned how to swim in the Ohio River. I wouldn't do that today, simply because it wouldn't be healthy. Particularly if you had a cut on your body, you may end up with a, some kind of deadly bacteria. But uh, we did that, and that's how we spent our summers. Of course, I went to uh, an all-black elementary school, Barnett Elementary, which now is uh, the home of our local auto zone. And so uh, it was the school that I went to from the first through the sixth grade. I went from the first to the second to the fourth grade in my progression of school. I never went to the third grade, so I don't know what that's like. Never been to the third grade. But when I left Barnett, I went to the all-black junior high school that was named Douglas High School. Barnett, incidentally, was named after a local doctor, Dr. Nelson Barnett who uh, was a very prominent figure here in Huntington and in fact started uh, a nursing school called the Barnett Nursing School. The building still stands on 7th Avenue and about 12th Street. The building still stands and if you look there's a cornerstone, Barnett. And it was a hospital. He was a doctor and so the elementary school was named after him. But when I matriculated from elementary to junior high, I went to Douglas Junior High, named after the great Frederick Douglass who was a civil rights pioneer way back in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Douglas was from the 7th through the 9th grade. Uh, that's where I went to Douglas. Uh, I left Douglas and went to Huntington High School uh, when Douglas closed. It closed in 1961 and so we were all farmed out to different high schools, either Huntington High or Huntington East. Douglas was located, as I said, on 8th Street and 9th Avenue, between 9th and 10th Avenue. And uh, the first group of, of uh, blacks went early in the mid-50s. Uh, maybe three or four people went early. I remember one fellow who was uh, uh, a pretty decent ball player, basketball player, Melvin Jennings. He went uh, early, and so he was already there. But when the the mass influx of us, if you could call it that, there were maybe oh, 15 or 20 or 30 of us. Douglas was a very small school because the black population wasn't that great. So when it closed, most of us went to Huntington High or Huntington East. Some went to the private school, uh, Marshall, and some went to St. Joe. Now Marshall had a, a school connected with the university and was kind of a learning academy, so a few people went over there. St. Joe, of course, is the Catholic high school, and a few people went there, but the majority of us went to Huntington High because we lived in the district for Huntington High. It always intrigued me how I could walk past Douglas, which was a very nice building, and it's now a medical center, an outreach medical center, and it always intrigued me to walk past that building, which was my beloved Douglas, all the way down to Huntington High School, and I always thought, well, why didn't they just leave Douglas open and integrate it? But the, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, I guess the Brown versus the Board of Education decision in 1954 in Kansas that the Supreme Court said across this land public schools must integrate with all deliberate speed. 
and another thing that, that really got me is that it took from 1954 when that law was passed to 1961 when Douglas finally closed. I said, well, that's deliberate speed, all right. That took seven years for it to close. Uh, of course, after I graduated from Huntington High School, a class of 469 people, so it went from about 17 to 469. Real cultural shock in that 12th grade year when, when we went to Huntington High. Incidentally, we just had our 50th high school class, Huntington High School class reunion, and uh, I was the only person of color to attend. There were people came from Europe who went to school as exchange students, and I was the only only black person there. But anyway, I went to, to Marshall, and I'll talk about that a little later after I graduate. Uh, talking a little bit more about integration in, in Huntington, uh, not just the school system, but of course, uh, the Supreme Court's decision in the Brown case spread to almost every aspect of, of a society, particularly in Huntington, West Virginia. A little different at Marshall, because Marshall, as, as I've heard that the president of Marshall at the time when most of us went to Marshall, the president went to the newspaper and made a plea not to, to publicize the fact that Marshall was going to totally open its doors to everybody regardless of their, their race, color, or creed, or their nationality. And he didn't want a lot of publicity. So we went to Marshall without a lot of fanfare. There wasn't any anything that was going on at the time, like the sit-ins in North Carolina. There wasn't any of that, uh, where people were, were talking about we're going to integrate. There was a problem with integration. I mean, there were, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of resistance to integration. Uh, I recall in the restaurants, there was a restaurant called Bailey's Cafeteria. It was for whites only, and we could not go. And to this day, even when they integrated Bailey's in the 60s, I've never been and decided that I wasn't going. I just decided that that wasn't the place for me. But there was another place that we, we they, I should say, because I wasn't, my mother told me she'd kill me if I said it, that was part of uh, picketing and sitting and going to jail. So I was too afraid to do that. But uh, there were those who went and actually picketed, signs and all, the old-fashioned pickets where you're walking back and forth with the placards at a place called the White Pantry. And it, it, it wasn't named that because it was whites only, but it was. And they were absolutely the last stronghold in terms of, of integration. They were determined that blacks were not going to go uh, to the White Pantry. And shortly after, after uh, court going to court, and there never was a decision in terms of whether we had the right to go. Uh, I guess the, the decisions around the country, the black sitting in North Carolina, uh, integrated the lunch counters like uh, there was a five and ten store downtown called McCroy's that we couldn't, we could go in and order and take it out, but after, after the hysteria around the country about integration, particularly at food counters, uh, they opened their their uh, food counters to anybody. It was just a little five and ten store, but we never could eat there until after uh, all the publicity and then we could eat there. And I have eaten there, but never did eat at the White Pantry, never did eat at, uh, at uh, Bailey's Cafeteria. Uh, we uh, had our own movie theater called the Carver Theater. And there was another theater up on 20th Street and, and an 8th Avenue called the RKO that we could go to one day a month. We could go to the amusement park, Camden Park, one day a year, and it was dubbed Colored Day, and we could go to the Camden Park then. Now, some of us got to go more than that, because my uncle worked at, at uh, Enco, a place that I later on in life worked, uh, and they had Enco Day. And during ENCO Day, all the ENCO employees and their families could go to Camden Park. And so I was part of his family, so I got to go twice a year. Uh, you could go to uh, the swimming pool, Dreamland. Now, we had our own swimming pool, A.D. Lewis. But you could go to Dreamland once a year. And uh, they had, uh, you could go to a pool over in Ironton every Monday. And 
the thing about that is they had colored day on Monday. The swimming pool was closed on every Tuesday in Ironton. And you know why? So they could clean it. <laughs> so it was closed every Tuesday. And they lost all that revenue after letting blacks come in one day a week. And it was open the rest of the time for whites. But we would catch the bus and go to Ironton when we wanted to go swimming. And didn't swim at A.D. Lewis, which was, was closed oftentimes because of repairs and, and what have you. But um, I grew up swimming right here at A.D. Lewis or in the Ohio River, which cost zero. So, so that's, that's how my childhood was spent. But we had our own movie theater. And of course, when integration took hold, our theater closed. The real feature about my neighborhood growing up was that we had mom and pop stores everywhere, uh, mostly black owned. And so we did most of our shopping for all of our groceries that we needed uh, at those stores, neighborhood stores. And they were on about the corner of every block that you came to. I could walk uh, less than, than 50 steps to uh, a grocery store where we bought all of our candy and, and bread and milk and things like that. Uh, then we did our the bulk of our shopping at the larger stores. But uh, the unique thing about my family is that my dad worked for the railroad, and on uh, what was then 16th Street, that is now Hal Greer Boulevard, named after the professional basketball player Hal Greer, uh, who was recently dubbed one of the top 50 players in the National Basketball Association, and incidentally was a neighbor of mine growing up. Uh, off of High Rear was what they call the Vecino Commissary. And we did most of our major shopping at, at the railroad store. So when people talk about the railroad stores, the coal mining stores, I know exactly what they're <coughs> talking about. And that's where you could go in and get your groceries, your heavy groceries, your meats and your vegetables. You could get those and you could run a tab. And so my family grew up in that railroad store because my dad worked for it. Uh, seeing a railroad for all those years. But when, as, as time passed and in the mid-60s when uh, integration started to take hold in Huntington, West Virginia, uh, which ironically enough was several years after most major cities, even though Huntington's not a major city, I would say at best we're a small town. But uh, Huntington lagged behind in integrating uh, in, in almost every aspect. But what it, integration did more than anything else is it took away that black culture. The black stores disappeared. The black clubs over time disappeared. The black nightclubs, uh, I mean, there was a nightclub called the Bisons, and it was the absolute social place to be, located on 8th Avenue between 16th and 17th Streets. It was the place that most adults went to. They dressed up, suit and ties, dresses, and that's, I couldn't wait till I turned 18 to be able to go into the Bisons. Lo and behold, shortly after I turned 18, the Bison's closed. Uh, and so that kind of thing happened. I mean, even the, the uh, what we refer to now as the bootleg joints, they closed up because we were allowed to go anywhere we want to. And so we chose to go to the established white places to eat for entertainment, movies, uh, uh, swimming pools. And for the most part, all the black entities closed. And so I, I see that as a uh, really not a positive in terms of, of integration. I think that's uh, one of the things that robbed us of our, of our entrepreneurial spirit, uh, pretty much. And there are very, very few black businesses in Huntington today. And I think it's because of that trend where we no longer had to rely on our businesses, but we went to other places. And I see remnants to the day using the clubs as an example. And they certainly aren't, they aren't the only, they aren't, they aren't the entity that, that typifies how they feel about black people. But if you go to a typical white club today, they are very hesitant about serving and treating African Americans the same way they treat their white customers. Uh, there was a documentary recently about a particular club downtown where they would greet you at the door and say, you can't wear that baseball cap in here. Uh, you can't wear that t-shirt in here. But if you looked in the club, there were many white patrons with baseball caps and t-shirts on. And that's today. 
but I, I don't want to suggest that we're, we're still living in the pre-60s because we aren't. There have been many, many strides uh, made that have been positive in nature in terms of where we live, for instance. Uh, I don't think that's a barrier anymore. But I learned after I graduated from high school that they directed most blacks into the general curriculum and not the advanced curriculum. I didn't know that, but th that was the case. And so that kind of predicts how you're going to succeed in college if you've had all general courses and you're competing, if you will, against people who have had the advanced math and the advanced science. Uh, I uh, made sure that I took the geometries and the trigonometries when I was in high school, only because I wanted to. My, my high school teachers from the black high school said, you need to take these courses. I mean, high school for me was, was in part more like a family thing at the black high school. And then it turned into you're just another one out of 469 at the white high school. And there were days when they made sure you knew you were black at the white high school. They made sure you knew and understood your role, but for the most part it wasn't like that because we were so few in numbers. It was minimal of problems. I'm not suggesting we didn't have them. There were problems uh, uh, all the time, and they were race-related for the most part. Now, there were other problems. I, mean, I can remember when the twist came out, and the assistant principal wanted to ban the twist because it was the gyration of your hips. And the students got together, black and white, and protested it. We had sock cops at the high school, and uh, they, they absolutely protested it, won the right to do the twist. So I can remember that. So not everything was race related. But that was my high school. And uh, our 50th reunion really brought back a lot of pleasant memories. A lot of very, very pleasant memories for me.